Our talk about water economics is in some ways very basic. It's about supply and demand, but in other ways, which is really intriguing, it integrates a lot of different disciplines to get to the core of how the finances and economics work. And we'll start with the water supply system. And the graphic you see here is a representation of the Seattle regional system that supplies Cascade as well as other agencies in the area. Uh, what defines it, and, and particularly at this point in the discussion, is the incredible amount of investment needed to supply and deliver water. And what you see here are alpine water systems, watersheds on the Cedar and Tolt River that deliver through a conduit of large transmission pipes water throughout the region. In addition, where that system ends, there are local distribution systems, pipes, reservoirs, pump stations to get the water all the way to the tap in a home or business. Billions of dollars of investment and billions more if it were to have to be replaced today. What that means for the economics is we have a lot of fixed costs in the system, in that investment and in the cost simply to maintain and operate it. And those fixed costs don't vary very much, they don't vary at all, when we're actually using water. If we use more or less, the cost doesn't change very much. Uh, there are some that do, the amount of pumping we have to do, the amount of chemicals we use in treatment, but most costs in our system are fixed. So it doesn't matter if we sell more or less water at a point in time, our costs are the same. In contrast, when we look at the customer side, we build primarily based on how much water they use. So our revenues are variable. Uh, we bill on water volume. If people use more water, we collect more money and everything's great. If people use less water, we wind up with a shortfall and we don't have enough resource to fund that system. Uh, so there is always a stress and a challenge here in terms of how we're gonna charge for water, how we have to invest to provide water, and how we're going to uh, balance those. An interesting point before I move on is most water utilities are in the governmental sector. Uh, they are operated as businesses, but they're operated by governments. And you might think about why that is. What makes water systems unique or, or somewhat unique that it's best served through a governmental business rather than a private for-profit business? I'm gonna move on now to supply and demand because this is really the crux of what drives our costs in our water system. This is an average water demand pattern. It's, it's averaged over the course of a year from January to December, and it shows the average for each month. The vertical axis is how much water people use or the community uses. In the winter time, in this example, it's about 20 million gallons a day for Cascade. Uh, that serves 350,000 people. In the summertime, it more than doubles. The peak month is about double that. If we went to the peak day, it would be half again as much. We have a peak demand in the summertime, when we do have summer, like we did this year, uh, that's in lawn watering, irrigation, outdoor water use. Uh, if we have a wet summer, a lot less. But this peak means our system has to be twice as big or more to meet all our needs compared to what we need for our basic uses indoors. That drives the costs. On the revenue side, we're only selling that water for a couple months. So the revenue associated with doubling the capacity is very limited, and that cost winds up getting spread over all the water usage. We'll look on to supply for a minute, but we'll come back to that theme when we talk about pricing. On the water supply side, we're blessed with a wet climate. Some people might say not blessed, but um, we have a wet climate that most of the time we have ample water. This is a direct contrast to California where their crisis is driven entirely by how much total water they have available that they can capture. For us, it's how much water we have to deliver in the summertime. And at the very time that those demands go up, our supplies shrink. The stream flows drop, the systems dry out, and we don't have enough water to meet the, the demands, the desires to use the water from our public water supply system. And that shortfall is shown here in red. Uh, what that means for us, back to our graphic, is we need to store water when it's available and have it available in the summertime when we would consume that storage. And in our system, there's two types of storage. Up in the mountains, you can see snow-capped peaks, Snow is a significant part of how we store water in our systems, in part because our reservoirs, the dams themselves, don't hold enough water to meet all our needs. We count on that melt, snow melt, that occurs in May, June, and July to keep meeting our needs so that the limited storage we have behind the dams can continue to meet those needs later in the summer. So think back to that graphic. What's gonna change how big that gap is? What, what changes in the way people use water or the way our water is coming out of our system would increase that and create risk of supply or reduce it and mean everything's fine. 
because that relates to some of the other uh, issues we're going to be talking about. The other th thing that comes into play here, because this is a very expensive system, is what happens when we have to expand it. I love this graph because it shows in a black line the history of water demand in the Seattle area for something like a 50-year period. And you can see early on in that period, it just kept going up. And when we did a forecast in, say, 1965, we projected that water use would keep going up. At that point, you have to start making decisions. Do I have enough water? If I don't, where am I going to invest to keep meeting those needs? There's two takeaways here that are profound to me. Every forecast sequentially over time has been below the forecasts that preceded it. Every forecast sequentially over time has exceeded what's actually occurred. And we're right now at a point where the forecast is virtually flat. So if at any point in time we see increasing demands and we're gonna make a huge investment in a new source, we're gonna increase costs in the system. If it turns out we don't need the water, we've incurred that cost, we have to raise rates, collect the money, and we have no use for that added resource, let alone the impacts on all the other systems that that has as we capture water for municipal use instead of leaving it in the rivers or the natural watersheds. So, as we're doing planning, we're looking at our supply as a starting point. We have a constant amount of supply, or I think we do. We have a, a projected demand. This is the old school. Population keeps going up. We expect demand to keep going up. This is what Cascade saw 10 years ago when it was formed and did its first plan. We were going to be out of water in 2025. We were going to have to spend $500 million to build a new source of supply. And that was going to roughly double how much water we had available. It was going to more than triple our costs which meant we'd have to more than triple what we're charging to cover those costs. But now we overlay a new reality, and that is the demands aren't going up. We just tripled our costs, we're not selling more water, prices have to go up even more. And in fact, we invested in a resource years, decades, perhaps a century before we needed to spend that money. What are all the other uses we could have made for that money within the water resource field or other fields uh, in our community? So our goal now is we want to make sure that we get this line, because it takes us more than 10 years to develop a supply. We want to make sure that we stay on that track, otherwise we may wind up back in the previous graph and run out of water. So we're going to look at tools for how we can accomplish that, delay that project, maybe eliminate it, and get back to a scenario where we have a cost-effective system serving our customers. We have two major tools that we use. One is conservation. This is a very busy chart. What it lists is about 50 conservation measures that we analyze for how cost effective they were in helping us save water. Where this is on the redu demand reduction side and how much water we could save. If we bring these tools to bear in a cost effective manner, can we keep delaying when we have to spend that $500 million? Conservation has many virtues, but one of the best ones from the system planning perspective is we can size it to our needs. If I have to build that new supply, I have to build the whole thing. I'm not going to put a garden hose to my new supply at Lake Taps. I'm going to build a big pipe and incur all that cost. Conservation, I can parcel it out and I can uh, stage it in over time so that it continues to help me manage that demand in a consistent fashion. From an economic perspective, that's much more efficient. We also have many measures, as this graph shows, that are cheaper than the ones you see in red, which are new supply sources. And those, it doesn't even matter how we would size them or how we would do them, they're cheaper than going out and developing new supplies. One that isn't included in here in supply, in, in this conservation, that I think is really part of the equation as well, is substitution. What that means is, do we have other ways to meet those demands, particularly those peak season demands, rather than out of drinking water? And an obvious one is wastewater reuse, uh, net zero projects, et cetera. So you could think about how we could manage beyond just these measures to make efficient use by using other resources rather than our drinking water. The other main way we have to control that demand outcome is pricing, is, is the water bill. Most homes and businesses get a water bill every month, water and wastewater. And it charges for access to the system and it charges for water use. And how we price can affect how people use water. Um, and I'm going to use some examples as we go through this. Most utilities meter all water use. By the end of 2016 in Washington, all utilities have to. There are actually a couple communities that haven't gotten there yet, which is interesting. They have unmetered homes. doesn't matter how much water you use. They don't know. 
It's like going to the gas station. When you fill the gas tank, we're measuring how much water is going in there. And like going to the gas station, we're going to start charging you based on how much you use, but we still have a lot of ways to do it. There are four examples here of how we might charge for water use. They have a fixed charge, and the, the vertical axis here is the monthly cost of water. The horizontal axis is how much water you use. Most of the charge systems are going to charge you more the more you use. Uh, there are lines shown here for average winter use, which is pretty much indoor use, and average summer use, which includes that outdoor watering to give you some frame of reference. Uh, in, a, in the average winter here, four to 5,000 gallons. That works out to about 50 gallons per person. It's always fascinated me thinking about my own water use. How do I use 50 gallons a day if I'm an average customer? But kind of getting beyond that, the pricing schemes go from the old school, charge a flat charge, doesn't matter how much you use, it's always the same, $40 a month. Um, this is um, the way most wastewater systems still charge for water, for wastewater service. Um, if you don't have meters, this is how you're going to charge. If you went back to 1970, the most common system in the U.S. is the next one, declining block. Uh, this is one where it's kind of volume discounts. It's like the Costco discount. You use more water, the unit price goes down. And so um, I may pay a dollar for a thousand gallons and then at some point it goes to 50 cents. It had the virtue, as did the flat rate, of the revenues being pretty secure because you're going to get the money. Even if people change how much water they use, there's not much revenue tied to that. The more aggressive systems that we've moved to in 1980 or 90, the most common was a uniform structure. This is like the gas station. So much per gallon, doesn't matter how many gallons. Or the newest and most popular today is an increasing block structure. The more you use, the higher the unit cost. So this is like going to the gas station. Your first 10 gallons are a dollar a gallon. Everything over that's five dollars a gallon. That's an increasing block structure. And what it does is it affects the way people think about that last gallon they use. And if that last gallon's in the summertime, when we have the deficit, it does a great job of reducing those peak demands that cause costs and stress on our water systems. Last point I want to touch to is the 2015 drought. I mean, it's not necessarily all economics, but it still ties in. The fascinating thing with the 2015 drought is there wasn't one. We have, at this point in time, almost exactly average precipitation in our region. But if you look at the graph on the right here, what you'll see is we had virtually no snowpack, where normally we have the equivalent of 30 inches of rain accumulated in snowpack in the mountains that then melts off into the summertime and keeps our reservoirs full and keeps our water supplied. We had virtually none this year, and by May it was gone. So back to our water system, we had a shortage of storage. We didn't get the free storage in snow, our reservoirs weren't big enough, and we had voluntary water restrictions in 2015 throughout our region. So, Climate change models tend to predict that this is our future. We're going to see more years like this and fewer years with what we've thought of historically as normal snowpack. How does that stress our system? As an economist, how does that affect the assumptions on how much supply I have and what I'm going to have to do uh, to balance my supply and demand in the future? How does it affect how I might price the water? Uh, I think there's a lot to be learned from this. In terms of the water system, how would I fix it? I'd build more storage. If I have to build more storage, I have to add huge amounts of infrastructure, infrastructure and raise rates. If I do that and costs go up so dramatically that everyone cuts back, I'm back in the trap. I've built all the infrastructure and by so doing, I force people to use less and in fact don't need it. So there's a conundrum there to consider is how do you balance these stresses in the system? Thank you.